Hello everyone and welcome again. And today we'll be talking about the industrial chemistry option. And in particular, we'll be starting a new topic on sulfuric acid and how we actually produce sulfuric acid and what we can use it for. Okay, so in order to produce sulfuric acid, of course, we have to talk about where it comes from. And that's this guy here, the sulfur crystal. Or in this case, it's just a, a lump of sulfur, pure sulfur. And so what we do is we want to know how we extract it so that we can sort of optimize that process as well as we want to know how to extract it because it's the sort of starting chain for our sulfuric acid production. Okay. So in order to talk about how we extract this sulfur, we need to understand the properties that we're going to be exploiting in order to remove it from the ground. Okay. We, want to, we don't want to be fighting against it, we just want to use the properties that it has to actually help us get it out of the ground. So it is an industrially important element because it's mainly used in the production of sulfur, uh, sulfuric acid. Okay? And we've seen sulfuric acid from basically the start of chemistry in year 12. So in production of materials, we've seen its use up until the end um, of chemical monitoring and management. We've seen sulfuric acid throughout. So the fact that it keeps popping up must imply that it's a very important industrial chemical. Now back to talking about sulfur or the, the yellow crystal here, its properties actually allow us to easily extract it from the earth. Okay? So the properties that this sulfur crystal contain make it easier for us to extract it. And so we'll go through each of them, or each of them really poignant ones, and we'll sort of try and explain why that actually helps us get it out of the ground. So the melting point of this sulfur crystal is about 113 degrees Celsius. Okay, That's um, quite low for an element or, or for a crystal. Um, so that's quite an interesting one. And so try to keep this, all of these properties in mind as we talk about the frash process uh, in a few slides time. So again, the reactivity is low. Um, so it can be found as a pure element in many locations, which is again a rarity among elements. You rarely find um, pure elemental forms of, of elements just lying around in the ground. So that's a, quite an interesting one. And it's not soluble in water. Not surprising, but it's also, you know, it's not a rarity, it's just not surprising either. So we'll talk about how the frash process works and how it interacts with these properties. And essentially the frash process was designed to exploit the properties of sulfur that we've already mentioned. Okay. So basically we start by boring a hole into the ground and then uh, putting concentric pipes into that hole. Okay. So here's our sulfur deposit down the bottom. And then here's just ground. And so we dug a hole and put three pipes in it. And remembering that concentric means you know circles within circles. So that's what it looks like if we were to look at it sort of from this way down. Okay, so there's three pipes, one inside the other, and so we put that down that hole that we just dug into the sulfur deposit. Okay. Now one of those pipes will carry superheated steam, which is at 160 degrees Celsius. So remember that that's higher than the melting point of the sulfur. And one carries compressed air, so one pipe carries superheated steam, Another pipe carries compressed air. And the last pipe carries the, the sulfur back in the opposite direction up to the ground and out to wherever we want it. Okay. So basically we'll talk about now what actually happens. So the superheated steam is pushed into the deposit, melting the solid sulfur. So from here you can see there's crystal sulfur here. The steam hits it, and because it's hotter than the melting point, it will melt the, the sulfur here and you get liquid sulfur in this deposit. So then we, compress, we pump the compressed air into the deposit, increasing the pressure in this deposit. Okay, And what that does is it essentially f forces the sulfur back to the surface. So there's the compressed air and it pushes that sulfur back up the remaining tube to the surface of the, to the ground. Then the, solid sul uh, the sulfur solidifies somewhere else, and we collect it. And that's how we get the pure sulfur from here. 
to wherever we want it to go. Okay. So of course now, with any mining process or any process in general, we should talk about what are the environmental impacts of it, because we need to know what it's going to do to the environment. Okay. So the first thing is the thermal pollution. So for those who are aware of thermal pollution, um, or who aren't, um, basically we're worried about the heat generated from this process in the form of superheated steam getting into waterways or other sensitive ecosystems. So remembering that a waterway, is, the organisms within that waterway are generally not uh, very well adapted to large temperatures changes. So if we suddenly add a lot of energy in the form of heat, then we increase the temperature of that, um, that waterway. And because the organisms are not used to that, they will obviously die. So dealing with that thermal pollution is a very serious issue for this process because we're using a lot of heat or energy in the form of heat um, in the form of steam. Now another one is the earth subsidence or subsidence. Um, so we just had this deposit of, so here's the ground and our deposit of sulfur is here. And before we started mining, there was all this sulfur here. And then after we started mining, or after we finished mining, sorry, there's now an empty space underneath. Okay. Now, obviously, that, create, that could be an unstable situation for the ground above it. And so we have to be aware of the fact that the ground above a sulfur deposit that we've just finished mining may be unstable. And so we have to deal with that. Um, either by collapsing it or somehow filling this hole with, um, with the same chemicals or with the same sort of densities. So we have to be aware that the earth may become a little bit unstable above our sulfur deposit because we took out what was underneath it. We can also produce sulfur dioxide, which we should know is a contributor to acid rain, and also hydrogen sulfide, which is that rotten egg smell chemical, um, so there can be some odour associated with this process. Now, so how do we solve these problems? Well, basically, we can allow the sulphur to cool in bins away from wastewater, uh, away from waterways, and we can allow the wastewater to not be discharged to local waterways. So that's how we deal with the thermal pollution. We don't discharge our water to local waterways. We let it cool somewhere else and then bring it back and dump it in the waterway once it's cold or we somehow deal with that water by recycling it or something like that. Now the production of sul hydrogen sulfide can be dealt with or it can be absorbed using the Klaus process. So the Klaus process is a chemical process that we're not going to talk about in great detail. Um, it's beyond the scope of this course. So we'll just know for now that this process can absorb hydrogen sulfide so the smell or odour issue is not a problem. And also the energy can be reduced by using better equipment, so better pumping devices, more efficient heating elements, those kind of things. And or we can completely sort of sidestep this whole process by taking the sulfur dioxide, which we produce when we smelt metals, because remembering that when we dig out metals, we smelt them to get rid of the impurities. And a lot of those impurities are sulfur based, so we can get a lot of sulfur dioxide from smelting. And so we might as well just use it to produce sulfur dioxide or to produce, uh, to get, you know, sulfur rather than, you know, digging out this pure sulfur, which we're eventually going to turn into sulfur dioxide anyway. So this could be a way to sidestep the whole fresh process or the need for the fresh process. Um, so that could be a way to solve that problem. So that concludes today's lesson on sulfur extraction. So we've talked about the fresh process and how the properties of sulfur allow us to extract it through the use of the fresh process. And we've also talked about the environmental concerns and the solutions to those when using the fresh process. Okay, so we'll move on to the question segment now. Identify the properties of sulfur that the fresh process exploits and explain how they're used to extract the sulfur. Okay, so the melting point of the sulfur is 113 degrees Celsius, so that's very low. So we can use the superheated steam to melt it, and that's the first thing that we exploit. It's not reactive, which is good, 
So the sulfur deposits can be fairly pure and that makes refinement easier. So once we melt the sulfur, it doesn't react that much with anything else. So that means the extraction and the refinement of the sulfur, process of the sulfur is quite easy. So that allows us to get a lot of sulfur or a very high concentration of sulfur very easily. And the fact that it's not soluble in water is also very useful because we can use steam to melt the sulfur and then because it doesn't dissolve, once it comes back out to the surface, then separating the sulfur from the steam or the water is very, very easy because they don't dissolve in one another, so we don't have to separate them. They'll naturally separate themselves. Okay. So moving on to question two, outline the procedure of the frash process. So if you look back uh, a couple of minutes ago, we spoke about exactly how the frash process worked. So we'll just review it here. So you bore a hole into the sulfur deposit. That's the first thing. Then you place concentric pipes into the hole. Right? Then you pump superheated steam into the deposit through one of those pipes, followed up by compressed air once the sulfur has melted. So after you pump the, sulf the, the steam, you melt the sulfur, then you pump compressed air in, and that will push the sulfur through the remaining pipe up to the top. Um, where you where you can allow it to solidify and collect it, okay. So that's basically a summary of the frash process in sort of five lines. Um, of course, if you were to answer this question, a uh, more difficult question like this in the HSC, you could go into much more detail about each point. But as a quick summary of what we've done, this is basically how the frash process works. Okay. So moving on to question three. What are the main environmental concerns when using the frash process and how are they overcome? This is the last thing that we talked about in this lesson. So we talked about thermal pollution. So what we can do is we can recycle the wastewater and can use it again. So we call that a closed loop because if you look at the water, it's going around in a loop and that loop is well closed. And so we don't actually have to discharge that water to waterways at all. And we can allow the sulfur that we've just pumped out of the ground to cool away from local waterways, so we don't want it to be near the local waterways at all. Now the production of unwanted byproducts, so H2S, can be removed through that class process that I mentioned. And while the conditions for the fresh process are generally not favorable towards the production of SO2, we have to monitor the, the fresh process to make sure that we're not getting any SO2 production that we're not expecting. So Basically this one, we just have to monitor it and adjust the conditions until we get it right. Okay. So that concludes today's lesson on the frash process and sulfur extraction. And so we looked at how the frash process works and what properties of sulfur we can actually exploit to make it easier to dig it out of the ground. So in the next few lessons we'll talk about how we actually produce sulfuric acid from this sulfur. And so I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson. Thank you.